The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts. It's been a long and kind of strange election season, so we thought we'd bring in Susan Monty to cut through some of the clutter. The former Democratic statewide official joins us next on another edition of Politically Speaking. Nine, eight, eight seven, six, six five, five, four, three, two, one. one. Uh, I think that is fair As to I say. say hands to kiss and babies to shake. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think my record speaks for itself. That's a really good question. Hello and welcome to the Politically Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Rosenbaum, a reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. Joining me in studio, she's back from Jefferson City, folks. <laughs> yes, uh, Joe Manis. And, and joining us from the beautiful and historic metropolis of St. Joseph, Missouri, <laughs> we have as our very special guest today. Susan Monte. Former state auditor, former Buchanan County auditor. auditor. Yeah. Former state Democratic Party chairman. That's right. So you, For, you're, Former you're, city council person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the reason we invited uh, the former Auditor Monty on the show is we had a previous podcast with former treasurer Sarah Steelman, and we thought it would be a good chance to step back a little bit, have somebody on the show who's been there before, who's not in it right now. So right. sometimes that sometimes those types of guests are actually some of our best guests because – they're, they're not running for anything, so they're a little bit uh, more freewheeling. So yeah, say. and please feel free to go to our website, and under the Politically Speaking uh, little thing, you can find the Steelman uh, podcast, which is actually quite good. Yeah, and um, but, but, but enough uh, nostalgia for, for now. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself for people who may not have followed your political career or our professional career. Well, um, you know, I am from St. Joseph, so I, I'm I'm living back at home now. I actually, it, it's so funny when I think about it as a as a political career because I never actually intended on on being in politics myself, except as an, an activist and, and a volunteer. Um, I always thought that that uh, my my husband was going to run for office, and I was training to be the support person or something. But um, I I actually ran for a, a city council spot. Um, in St. Joseph, I moved back there, and I, I think I was, you know, in my 40s, and I, I ran for a city council spot because I was angry about something. We had uh, one city council woman, um, or one city council member who was a woman, and she got bullied and pushed around and resigned, and I, I, I just uh, kind of decided that they needed a little more stronger stuff on the, on the city council, and I, I did that without ever thinking of running for anything else. And then because I was unhappy about the way our our county auditor got replaced, and it, at the time, um, county auditor in Buchanan was the place where everyone um, went to die. Um, we had all of our auditors died in office because they were former something else that then got appointed <laughs> to the auditor's office. And um, so it, when I, I worked as, I was chair of the county there, and um, and when we went to look at the county auditor's office, um, we figured out that we weren't computerized. This would have been in in 1998, um, 1999. You would be surprised, but in a <laughs> lot of counties in Missouri in, like, the 2000s, they were not technologically savvy. I remember there's a situation like Howard County, for example, where the clerk – resigned for some reason and the new person found that it was just a mess so i'm sure it's very similar even in larger counties like buchanan for example well we were handwriting our checks and uh, i know that because i was set to take office on january 1st and on new year's eve they called me after i had gotten elected they on new year's eve they called me and they said oh my gosh we have our our checks all set with the old auditor signature electronically on them, and so it won't be any good tomorrow, so you need to come in and hand sign all of the paychecks. <laughs> oh so that was my first duty as county auditor. And, and I ran for that just primarily because of that. I thought that it needed to be 
automated. And and yes, you're right about all these other counties, because when I became state auditor, of course, I had to audit all the counties in the state. And so I know how prevalent it was. And my my outrage was probably a little misplaced because Buchanan County was a little better off than some of the other counties. So. Yeah. Now, one of the interesting things for our listeners to know about Susan Monte is that you uh, you're a lawyer and a CPA. Yes. And that was a big deal <laughs> when you were first running. And um, actually, it was a pretty hot contest, your very first bid in mm-hmm. 2006. And anyway, so you won. And then in 2010, um, which happened to be kind of a dark year an, for Democrats. An ugly year. <laughs> ugly, yeah, ugly is pretty good. Um, Tom, You were challenged by Tom Schweik. Mm-hmm. And uh, it got to be somewhat of a nasty contest, not so much... Uh, really, it was more nasty on the Republican primary side between Ellen Isett and Tom Schweik than it was between you two. That was yeah, my perception. Well, I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. I thought it. No, I thought it got a little nasty at the end. I covered your one debate at yes. the Lake of the Ozarks. I remember that one very clearly. And uh, and but what's what's intriguing to me um, is what happened that year. The as general assumption had been because this was 2010. Off year, no president. Um, Democrats often don't do that great in Missouri in off years because their people don't come out. Re- Republicans tend to be more reliable voters. And the bottom line is that um, Robin Carnahan, who was running for the U.S. Senate against Roy Blunt, this was his first bid for Senate. She was Secretary of State making her first bid for the Senate. She had been favored a year and a half ago, but by the summer of 2010, she was not in good political shape. And the bottom line was she ended up losing by Blunt that fall by about 14 percentage points. That's right. And you had been considered likely to win re-election, but you ended up losing to Schweik by five. And your loss was one of the first uh, cases of a down-ballot incumbent losing in, like, decades. But my the reason I'm bringing all this up is because now we're in a presidential election year, and there are many people who talk about the trickle-down. I mean, in 2012, many believe that uh, Claire McCaskill's uh, contest against uh, Todd Aiken ended up changing the the trickle down so it wasn't from the presidential contest it was from her contest and it helped democrats below when when you look back i mean i was interested in you talking about that i mean when you knew that you were losing because you were considered to be winning till about a month out and just kind of what the effect that has if if there's a can if there's a race above you that ends up being a blowout right and that and that is exactly what happened and it was um i mean we could see it coming we we knew because at some point um it it was very clear that no national money was going to come in to robin carnahan's senate race um and and you know, there's a there's a whole separate dialogue we can have as to why the Democrats don't have an infrastructure for getting out the vote anymore, and that um, stems back quite a ways. And we still don't have it now. When you say anymore, you mean there used to be? There did used to be. Um, back, um, <laughs> you know, in, in in Mel Carnahan, when Mel Carnahan was running um, for governor, we had a, a a big ground game that came from um, the Democratic Party infrastructure. And he had, a, he had a lot of emphasis on on the Democratic Party. And and we don't have that anymore. And we haven't had it for, you know, for quite some time now. And, and, a, and a big part of that fell apart, of course, during we had a, the, the, the problem with the, you know, the primary election in 2004, where we were very di- divisive when Claire McCaskill was was running against yeah, Bob, Bob Holden, Holden the so, governor. But yeah. if we go back to um, the support that uh, Mel Carnahan had for a party infrastructure. That was the last time that we really had that. So if you don't have national money coming in and some kind of a get out the vote that is being run from something other than just I- igniting our our what should be our infrastructure from the party, um, it, it, it's very difficult to get our our votes out if we don't have that. And that's what happened in um, in the election in 2010. In 2008. Um, you know, we had the Obama campaign running. Yeah, because our they were making a serious pitch in Missouri, Correct. and they they stayed the whole time. And they, they did stayed not. The they whole did time. not. The Kerry's campaign did not stay the Correct. whole time in 04. And actually, I think that Obama's campaign in 2008 was actually the last one where there was a serious presidential spending 
Correct. In the state. I know I get hammered by some of the <laughs> operatives. Don't call me. I know about this. But I'm just saying that, you know, that was the last big it, one was in 2008. And again, I, and with no disrespect to Hillary Clinton's campaign, I, I covered 2008 election cycle along with Joe. No, there no comparison between the Correct. Obama campaign then and the Hillary Clinton campaign now. Oh, no, now. no. And so if you look back and you, and you go, well, we had, um, you know, we had this this divisiveness um, in, in 2004, and then we were relying on the Kerry campaign for our, our, our big push at the end in our ground game and our field game. And they had promised to stay. And they had promised and to this stay. This is one of my big stories Correct. is that the presidential debate, um, Terry McAuliffe, who is now the governor of Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, who was then the uh, DNC chair, was there with Dick Gephardt at a big press conference earlier in the day, and I asked him, because there were rumors that they were pulling out. And he said, no, 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 no. We're serious. We're here to the end. We're serious on Missouri. And then it wasn't 24 hours later, I was getting calls from a, uh, a, a particular key Democratic operative. But I got some calls from some who say, you might want to drive up to Lambert because they're all boarding they're planes. All and yeah. they did. And they, you know, we, we, had, um, we had many of our offices at the Monty Law Firm. We had these offices. And and um, we, uh, Jim and I individually owned all those offices so that we could donate them, you know, um, in-kind donations. And so we had, we had um, people in all of our offices and they just, you know, they just left the keys on the desk, yeah. uh, basically. And so in uh, 2004, we, you know, we weren't able to then to pull it off and, and Claire lost that um, governor's race. Now, because 2006 was the you know the swing back from yeah. well, and there was the Iraq and, and War. And there was the all this there was the backdrop, and we had this Senate race, and yes. and we really felt like we could win that. And the stem cell, and the stem cell. So we had, and we had minimum wage on the ballot too. Yeah. We had a lot of things so going there was on a to drive huge, turnout. Huge amount of money that Correct. year, and it was a lot of Democratic money, mm -hmm. and not a good, not a good Republican environment. Right. So right. that again, right. that just goes to exactly. Joe's point. The national environment matters. It does. Many, it it does. And so that's then, uh, you know, where we had in, in 2008. And then, um, you know, not so much. And had we, in, in, and then in, in, uh, by the time we got to 2010, yeah. um, we had, uh, you know, we were <laughs> relying on the fact that national money was going to come in for this Senate race, and it didn't happen. So when that ha when we didn't have that, then there was no ability to to get out the vote. We could call up the Democratic Party, but they had never activated any of the local, you know, volunteers. We just didn't have anything. The, so the votes didn't turn out. And traditionally, we don't, just like you said, we don't get our, our voters out anyway. So we have to have an extra push to do it. Um, and that's what happened in 2010. Now, I, you know, I, I know that you say we got the benefit in 2012. Now I happen to have lost that year too, but I think yeah, that's a well, whole different I was gonna story. Get to, I was going to get to that because, in fact, I interviewed you at the time. Does Nixon talk to you since you talked to me? Because <laughs> I did this story where I you were know. you were really jabbing the governor, well, saying because he took all the money that was supposed to be that. Well, he did. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it is it is what it is. Um, I I do remember one of his when I complained one of his staff people saying, "Now, Susan, you know, this could come down to a seven or eight point win for us." And and, and and so it's not close. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> Seven or eight points is like a landslide. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, just so our listeners know, you were running for lieutenant governor yeah. in 2020. Yeah. And I mean, I don't want to I don't want this to be like a let's bash no. Jay Nixon show, but he does have kind of a reputation even among Democrats of not being particularly helpful in, in campaigns and That's being right. somewhat selfish. Even. Well, and and yeah, and and to be honest, I never expected any any help from anyone else who was on the ballot that year. And and it, because I think everybody does need to run their own races. And and, and had I not had um, a primary election, we would have had enough money. But because it of the a, timing on that, it was a weird primary yeah. election. Yeah, because I, I, I <laughs> there was like four candidates. Uh, uh, no, there were eight <laughs> candidates. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Well, I, I was thinking about the serious ones. No, I mean, but it, there were there were some former state reps there yes. that I would consider that did not get a lot of votes that I would not consider unserious well, candidates. Like Fred Cracky, for example, came in last, but. You know, he was Truth, a state rep. You truthfully, know, truthfully, 
every single I had an eight person primary. Every single one of the people in that primary had had run for and been elected to something yes, before. Yes, exactly, exactly. It, it there wasn't, wasn't a bunch of perennials. No, it was so it was it was very bizarre. And 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 what happened is, um, I, I I mean I felt certain that I was I was going to um, win the primary, and, and in fact I, I I won the primary by a lot, like thirty points. So. It, uh, people wouldn't give me money and support early on because they said we don't have to because we know you're going to win the primary and then we'll be there for you afterwards and then we don't have to hurt anyone's feelings. Now, by the way, that whole hurt feelings things really bothered me because no one ever talks to male candidates about having hurt feelings. However, um, so but but what happens is that the time between um, a the the primary election which is in election, august early is, august it's too short and you can't um if you have to go through the then approval process for the labor unions for example everything takes so long and you don't get your money until the end and it and it just it it became very dif- it be- became very difficult and then we saw that coming we tried to guard against it but you know. because you ended up being aside from uh, Obama, I think you were the only Democrat who lost that was running statewide in 2012. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's uh, it, but, it, <laughs> now, now to be yeah, fair, not to, not to, to be fair to our guest, well, don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> oh no. But, but, but to be fair to our guest, you were running against Peter Kinder, who had never lost an election before. He had run against serious candidates. I mean, Becky Cook is a serious candidate. Oh, yeah. Sam Page was a serious candidate. Yeah. And, you know, he used some pretty hard-edged tactics against you. I remember pretty clearly that he ran an ad criticizing you for being at a gay pride march in (laughs) St. Louis. I think it was only aired in in rural Missouri. And I brought this up to David Barklage, who was with Peter Kinder at the time. because He was a consultant. And I I asked him about it because Barklage was with Tom Schweik as well. And he wrote what I would consider a very heartfelt message of regret for a lot of things that he did after Tom Schweik mm-hmm. died. And I brought this ad up because I was like, well, do you regret this particular moment in your career? Here's what he had to say about that. When that ad came out, a lot of people in the gay community here in St. Louis were really upset about mm-hmm. that. And you were with Peter Kinder then. Is that the type of ad that maybe you were regretted, you know, sending or being a part with? Well, I, you know, I think that uh, the purpose was sort of to point that her her values in regards to issues and things were out of touch with rural Missouri. And, you know, I think the uh, politics have changed in terms of, of uh, gay issues, as, as we've seen, like on, on, on gun issues, it's gone decidedly pro-gun. I think on gay issues, it's gone decidedly the other way. So it wouldn't be used, one, because it wouldn't be very effective. And then, two, uh, you know, I... I think you always look back. You have, I think, you have a regret in a campaign of anything you say or do as negative. Because, guys, just like you, when you report a story that outs someone and destroys their career, I don't sure. think you get up the next day gleefully. Now, no. maybe some do, where because they think they're going to go war. But I think yeah. most people there is a regret to it, mm-hmm. and I think that regret's the same. You do your job. Your candidate is the one that says, you know, yes or no, and the pollster. But in the end of the day. You don't want to live your life or have your career where it's Mm -hmm. defined by one moment. So that was a long clip, and I had to Mm -hmm. cut it off quickly because I (laughs) I rudely interrupted him after that. But I'd I'd like to hear your your thoughts on that because I I, I like David Barklage. I like Peter Kinder. I'm not trying to, like, you know, castigate him. But, I mean, that ad struck me as kind of a low blow against you in a way, and I felt like it needed a response. What, well, what's kind of your thought on that? I, I agree with that. I I, uh, I now have, have got a lot tougher uh, skin on a lot of things than I, than I used to have in my, in my youth where I, I was all a little naive as to how this was going to go. And, and certainly every single campaign I've had has had at least one thing that I thought was, was pretty outrageous against me. And, and I, I thought this was, too. Um, I just found it super offensive that, um, you know, that, that, that we would, um, you know, take the gay community and say, oh, we don't want to have any support and don't support this person. I, I, I don't know. In, in my opinion, if anybody didn't want to vote for me because I support gay rights, and that's fine. I support a lot of um, a, a lot more Democratic liberal causes than most of our Democratic candidates will <laughs> admit to doing, and, and I always have. Um, 
It, but I do think that that it it didn't have to be a negative campaign against me. It was clear, you know, even though Peter Kinder tried to say, oh, I didn't get much money at the end. Peter Kinder spent, you know, several million dollars in that race mm -hmm. from the point where he was running in this primary election. And, 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 we, the, and just to he, point out, he was getting attacked pretty mercilessly by Brad Lager. You also uh, ran attack ads against him. So I want to just mention that mm -hmm. for fairness, but continue. We did. But what happened is that um, the amount of money that Peter Kinder had to spend in order to shore back up his and, and reinforce his name ID uh, was 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 way out of proportion for how that race would have been with any other candidate in it because he was able to raise you know three to four million dollars because he was running for governor well, then when he dropped back into the lieutenant governor's race right. he had that money to spend and so because I, it was I, statewide I, listeners you, they can't do it if you're running for congress but you can correct. do it if you're running for statewide office so so he when you looked at it at the end of the day um, over the election cycle, Peter Kinder spent four million dollars, right. and we only had one. So, it, 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 the negative ad maybe helped or hurt or didn't didn't really. But that probably is a big. Do you it, mean, I mean, are you yeah. kind of glad though in the end that you didn't have to be lieutenant governor and preside <laughs> over the Senate a lot? I mean, let's be let's be <clears throat> candid here. If you had sure. won. The vast majority of your time over the last four years probably would have been presiding over the Senate and trying to basically wreak havoc on the Republican Which majority. is controlled heavily by Republicans. I mean, so, I mean, are you kind of glad that you got to do well, other things besides that? I did get to do other things. Um, I went in that eyes eyes open. Yeah. Um, a part of, of why I said I, I would run for something like lieutenant governor, which, you know, everyone has con has talked about being kind of the ribbon cutter. And, and, and that's why I had a lot of people say, yeah, Susan, we love you, but we're not going to send you any money because we don't care who the lieutenant governor is. Peter Kinder hasn't caused any trouble the whole time he's been there. I said, well, I promise I promise you, if you let me be lieutenant governor, I will cause all kinds of trouble. So you're right. I would have been <laughs> uh, sitting there causing trouble. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, you look back and you go, really, would that be the way you want to live every day is getting up and having to fight in that environment? And I think it's an, it's an incredibly awful environment right now in Jefferson City. And um, I, I'm a little disheartened by you know some of the things that they pass and do. Now, how heavily are you involved in any, as far as supporting or helping to raise money or doing anything for for any of the Democratic statewide candidates now? In the case of Lieutenant Governor, mm -hmm. it's Russ Carnahan, um, who is, in this time, Kinder is not running for re-election. Yes. And so... Um, Wait, it's against Mike Parson. Mark Parson, right, I, the Republican. So they're lesser known. I mean, mm -hmm. Russ Carnahan arguably has more name recognition, but... That doesn't necessarily mean anything. Parson obviously is going to be yeah. hammering him on various issues. I'm just interested in how active you are in helping well, or hurting or raising money or doing well, whatever. Over the last month or so, couple, last couple of months, I have shown up in Jefferson City and done some call time for the party. That's not going very well because people want to give to individual candidates. Um, but now, over This is in, interesting. Tell me about that. Well, um, you know, we actually... Um, the the party has largely been supported over the last year by Chris Coster writing checks directly to the party in order to to keep the the party doors open. He's he's been great about it, um, but the party really needs to move towards more sustainability on its own. Um, I mean, because at some point he's gonna he needs. To keep that money for him. Yeah, I mean, exactly, now getting, you know, exactly. Like now. <laughs> but it's very, but it's really difficult to get people to give money directly to the party because they don't, they're not seeing that the party's doing anything. But the party itself, this is kind of what I alluded to, we need this infrastructure back. And so once we get past this election, I think it'll be the time, especially if we get campaign finance ah, limits yeah. back in place. It'll make all the difference. It'll in the make world the parties well. more influential. Yeah, and and the the thing about it, I have never believed that the parties were only beneficial to throw money through. I really think that they're supposed to be the way that you're, you know, you're 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 passing information to and from in your organizational structure. So, um, I I'm still a big fan of the party. So I'm I'm doing things for the party. I um, have a building that I own in St. Joe. Joseph that I have um, that I'm have Democratic headquarters running out of and so I'm paying all the expenses associated with um, utilities and internet and then I own the building and so we've got people running there I've done 
um, fundraisers for, I've done a couple of them for, for um, General Coster, and I did one for Russ Carnahan and mm-hmm. Jason Kander, and mm-hmm. I do those at my house. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing things. I, I can only do so much. Um, I, 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 uh, I'll do anything anybody asks me to that I think will make a difference. Well, so. I noticed because I, I, I think I'm Facebook friends with you. You <laughs> shared my article today where I talked about how the Democrats in the legislature basically got crushed during veto session. And yes. I did notice that. Um, and I mean, it didn't bring me a lot of joy to write, <laughs> to you know, write the, to write the Democrats are getting crushed. You know, just as if the Republicans were getting crushed. I wouldn't right, enjoy but that's that not too. our job. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But it, but it is what happened. Like it was, Correct. it was not even very suspenseful as it was in previous years. It's probably it's because, in in my opinion, the, the, the Democrats have lost incredible ground in the legislature, especially in rural, rural parts Missouri. of the state, which they used to dominate, like in 2008 and 2006. The fact that there are no Democrats from Northeast Missouri anymore right. should be very alarming to Democrats statewide, I think, and in the legislature, I mean. I agree. Yeah. And and that's a part of the whole the whole issue with um, what is what does the state party represent now people we and they say oh why isn't the party doing anything and there's just it's it's like you you picture the party as being this you know presence out there that is out doing stuff and it and that's i mean that in reality obviously that's not the case but we can't even um recruit candidates to run for a bunch of these districts because there hasn't been any kind of support mechanism for them and and so we can we can go the the local people can say hey why don't you run for this state rep seat but the republicans are supporting their candidates um with an organizational structure and we don't have that in yeah, place because one thing that is again i'm this is one example because I, I i hear all the time from democrats they blame their legislative woes on quote unquote gerrymandering now i will not disagree with the fact that the map that came out after 2011 was not favorable to the democrats in the house yeah but let's not get but too let's much not in get into that one thing that I always I found this year, there is a seat that includes Monroe County, Rawls County and Pike County, which is which is now represented by a Republican. In 2006, there is no way a Republican would have won that seat. Right. A, a Democrat would probably be running for that seat on a post. This year, there is not a Democrat running for the seat right. against the Republican incumbent. And that is replicated in multiple places where there used to be that used to be Democratic mm-hmm. up until five or six years ago. So Yeah, so now looking here at 2016, I mean, with what Jason yes. just said in mind, um, there's been, in fact, I've by the time listeners hear this, hopefully I will have had my story on the website, which has to do with the Senate race, but a part of it is about the Trump effect or the estimate or what the GOP hopes will be the Trump effect especially in rural Missouri and in the suburb, some of the outer suburbs, including Jefferson County, uh, Lincoln County, I'm just using this, where they think that there are um, disgruntled uh, blue-collar workers and, and maybe older people, and some of whom may have previously been Democrats, who like what Trump has to say, and they're hoping that that then translates to help the rest of their ticket. Roy Blunt, who's in a tight race with Jason Kander, and then on down, you know, we've got Eric Greitens running against Coster, and he's raising a lot of money, and so that one's getting nasty, and all down the line. So as you're looking at it from the outside, but being somebody who's hosting fundraisers, and plus your base, at least in St. Joe, I would think you would have at least a sense of whether or not there is much of a Trump effect as far as energy, because a lot of it's going to depend on turnout. I'm just curious what you're seeing. Well, I, I'm not seeing um, I'm not seeing the excitement level that would drive turnout, but um, for for Trump supporters, now I, there are certainly if you ask people, I I am not seeing like an organized um, um, wave that is that that is getting people excited and then bringing other people into the fold to to get out and help and volunteer. But I think it's probably because they just don't have an, uh, any kind of um, field staff here doing that if they if they were having functions maybe there would be we're not seeing that um, at least not in the northwest missouri area but there are a a lot of disgruntled people i think even if you look at our um the way our our presidential primary went on the democratic side is that we still have a whole lot of people out there who are who are dissatisfied and they are dissatisfied not in a way that went for donald trump but dissatisfied in that they in a way that Caused them to be for Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders yeah. and and so we 
um, there, there's, it goes both ways. The number of people that I have run into in rural Missouri that were Sanders supporters makes me think if we'd been out there talking about liberal oh, yeah. issues and we hadn't rolled over on everything liberal out in our rural areas that we might actually have those people as Democrats again. So are the, the Sanders people who you're talking to, are they going to vote for Hillary or are they going to go third party just to show their... Yeah, that's a tough one. I, you know, I, 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 just believe, what you're yeah, I believe most of them um, will will turn out and vote for Hillary Clinton. You know, it's easy to say. I I look back to, to my youth um, where I was I was I was going to vote independent in the presidential election that um, John Anderson, which 19- you won't know, but you would know. Yeah, Joe. I, was, I wasn't born <laughs> when she's talking about you. She's exactly. talking about me. Joe will know, but yes, you, you actually, won't know that. I was actually working. But I, you know, I, I'm a college student and I'm thinking I'm an independent. I'm not just because I grew up in this Democratic family and it's all this. I'm going to. And when I went into the polls, I still voted for Jimmy Carter. So I, I think when it came down to it. Um, I might have thought I was independent, but but at the end of the day, I, I voted for the Democratic candidate. Not that it. Although that was what thirty <laughs> was six a long years ago. ago. But it's still this and mindset, things and things do change. Um, yeah. So, but but these. Um, so I, does Clinton have much of an operation in your neck of the woods at all? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, um, we have a, a pretty good Clinton operation going on in Kansas City. Not so much up in 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 St. Joe. We don't we have people there, but most of our people that are working out of headquarters are calling on behalf of the Coster campaign and mm-hmm. and um, putting out signs for Jason Kander. So we don't we don't actually have any of the Hillary people there, but but I, I anticipate that we will have. So I mean, are you? I know the state Republican Party, you know, generally prides itself in being fairly organized. Are they having to take the place of the lack of a Trump operation? I know there is a Trump headquarters, and I know the two guys who are running it in Jeff City. But, you know, I've been hearing this, too. I mean, because there's just been an office recently that was opened for Trump in um, Fenton. And I had written something, and then I got a call from the Trump people saying, you need to emphasize, that's not us. That's volunteers. Right. So it's not, I mean... So these are volunteers who are doing it on their own. Right. And so and this is this is the whole question of infrastructure. When I talk about party infrastructure, I mean, do you have people who everyone in the county would know that they can call up and they're going to figure out how to get a sign or any of that? If you don't have visible people that are always there as your committee person or your ward person or whatever, I, I think it's even hard to, to organize a volunteer effort. Um, but, yeah, we're not seeing... Um, any kind of organized thing up up where I am. And well, so what what does that mean? Do you think? Well, I hope it means that uh, they're not going to be able to generate a whole bunch of extra excitement and people going to the polls to um, to vote Republican. That people won't see that it makes a difference, or whether it does make a difference. And and we don't know <laughs> whether Missouri would make a difference or not. Um, right now, we're not on you know we're not on anyone's list of our no. state has to matter in the presidential race. Yeah, I mean, just our listeners mm-hmm. know we used to be a must win. Well, we still are must win for Republicans, for, for Republicans, for Republicans. but not for Democrats. And that can make a difference if, for states that are like that, because if one party is like, well, I don't need it, and they're not campaigning there, then the other party, even if they need it, as long as they think they're doing okay there, they're going to spend their money somewhere else because there's no reason to spend it. Here, when let's say they need to spend it in Ohio, where it's competitive mm-hmm. and where Ohio has been ground zero since 2004, frankly, yeah, in the presidential definitely. contest. Now, I, and I was thinking about this the other day because Joe mentions, and so do I, that in 2012, Mitt Romney lost or won the state by nine or ten percentage yes, points. Ten points. But the trickle down effect was nullified by the fact that Todd Akin imploded, Claire McCaskill did incredibly well, and that helped most of the ticket. I, I could be wrong. Today is September 16th, and if I am wrong about this, you can play this clip from here <laughs> to the rest of the career. Okay. But having observed Roy Blunt and Eric Greitens, and, and you've known Roy Blunt longer than I have, I do not think that either one is going to make a Todd Aiken-like disastrous comment. I, again, I could be wrong, but both of them are very disciplined when it comes to messaging. Some would say that they're over-disciplined. Well, so, uh, and that's why on the Democratic side, too, somewhat. I mean, Candor... Uh, Jason Kander, who is challenging Blunt, I mean, he may be somewhat lesser known, but he's really being active. His ad, yeah. the ad that's running now has gotten national attention. And, of course, you've got Coster, who also um, 
you know, is, has been working really hard. And I, and I do want to mention one thing. All these candidates, regardless of party, people seem to forget. If you're based in Jeff City, candidates based in Jeff City who are a big shot in Jeff City seem to think they're big shots in the rest of the state. <laughs> the yeah. state political history is littered with people who are big shots in Jeff City yeah. and lost statewide. I just want yeah. to mention but, but here's the reason I mentioned that part. Like, if Trump ends up winning the state similarly to Romney did, and we don't know if that's going to happen, but if it does, and you don't have a right. variable like what happened in 12, shouldn't that be a cause of concern for the rest of the, the Democratic ticket, yes. essentially? You know, and, and yes, I think that's true, because um, with, with the exception of um, Attorney General Coster, because I think that, that Coster has a unique niche that he has carved out of voters. He's going to get all of the Democratic support. Um, any any Democrats, even if we don't have good turnout, they're going to turn out and they're going to vote for him. But but he has um, ha has coalesced a, a large group of Republican voters that traditionally would vote Republican in the in in his endorsement by the Farm Bureau and and the NRA. And mm -hmm. so when people who are independents look at at all of that he has a tendency i think to take those people as well yeah because so, the farm bureau has it yeah. that, that ad with the, with the farm bureau but mm -hmm. i i, I did want to talk about that from a policy standpoint we talked a little bit about this for the show and i i don't know again how that's going to play out politically but <laughs> from somebody who studies rural missouri and policies there for a long time him getting all the endorsements of these agricultural commodity groups like the Farm Bureau or the pork producers is a really significant moment in the policy history of the Democratic Party. Because for a long time, you know, Democrats kind of clashed with those commodity groups. They thought that they were like too tied to big agriculture mm -hmm. or, or, or big ag policy. Now you have a gubernatorial candidate that's basically embracing that type of thing and a legislature that also agrees. So isn't that going to have a pretty monumental effect on agriculture policy if he wins, basically? Yeah, I, I think it will. And, and I, I think that for the most part, a lot of people don't understand that. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's it's so interesting about this, um, you know, from the party switch standpoint is, you know, when, when Chris Custer switched parties, he didn't switch any of his policies. He had the same— Except abortion. Well, <laughs> except for he wasn't—it it was almost like— it didn't matter that much. I don't. I don't I, that's probably not the right way to say it. He didn't have a strong stance one way or another on okay. choice. However, the the thing that did stem make cell. a difference was the stem cell, yep. which is closely aligned to it. So, but, but I, continue your other correct. Point, yes. So, with the exception of he said, you know, he had he had said choice. Eh, eh. <laughs> no. I mean, I hate to say that because this is a strong issue well, for me. No. But he didn't. He never. He didn't ever come out as but, strongly one way or another in choice, but he did on stem cell, which put him but clearly— you're, you're 100% in right, and this is something mm -hmm. that I think has been really underlooked by a lot of people, that when he did switch parties, he didn't change a lot of his policy no. views on things. Like, up until a month ago, he was opposed to campaign contribution limits, and he was he, he now is for well, them. Well, I wouldn't say a month ago, maybe yeah. two months ago. But I'm saying, well, like— Well, you, see, you, see, you start seeing— I, I, but I'm just saying, like, exactly. I'm agreeing with your point. Basically. Yeah. So he he didn't he didn't shift. That's that's the thing that was that that struck me as odd about Eric Greitens. So Eric Greitens, um, up until he um, decided to run, said he was you know he was a Democrat and he went to Democratic things. When he said I'm a Republican, he says therefore here's my positions, and they were all Republican issues. There there wasn't a single position that he said that he believed that would have put him ever in the Democratic camp. So I have I don't know where he Well, although stands. to be fair, <clears throat> on gay when it when it comes to uh gay rights issues, Greitens has been a bit more moderate on that because yeah. there was some the SGR thirty. Yeah, the SGR yeah, thing. Yeah, there was Correct. some exchange and stuff going on but, and he did Yeah, but that did. was a business thing. That was because the businesses were all it, it didn't really it, it wasn't as if as if he was have, champion something. But I have heard that before that mm -hmm. some of Greitens critics just they they don't believe that somebody could be a democrat and then adopt all the republican <laughs> positions whereas even if you don't like the fact that chris coster is more conservative on things at least you could point back to you know five six seven eight years ago and, and point to some consistency there correct and that and that's what i'm saying it's it's the it if you have these people you know it's like a big Venn diagram you got your democrats that all believe in your republicans and you got this center area 
in where they overlap, and that's where you ought to find your moderate Republicans and your moderate Democrats. And you couldn't tell who's a Democrat or who's a Republican. And Chris Coster was one of those guys mm -hmm. because he he had these conservative things, but he also had union support and the trial lawyer support. So he was always in that middle area. But to be fair to Greitens, you know, I think he's also a very attractive candidate. He beat three very tough opponents in a primary. He, I, you know, I've noticed like his campaign is is very aggressive and very responsive. Whenever he's criticized, they have an ad on TV like the next day. Yeah, they're very he's, disciplined. So I, I think oh, yeah. like he's very formidable, and I think that he is getting like a lot of legitimate, very passionate support among a lot of people. So how does Coster combat with something like well, that? I, and and I agree with all those things, but I, I guess where I'm saying is my problem with this whole thing is I really don't know his policy position on anything. I mean, I, I, what you say you're going to do versus what you are going to do and what you have done in the past. And he's never been in any, any kind of position where you know how he's going to govern because he has no experience whatsoever in any kind of governmental setting. Um, he may be a smart guy, which I'm sure he is, but, but because of this whole thing where he has never taken any, he didn't take any con positions on, as a as a Democrat, and, and, and he's adopted all Republican ones, I don't know. He may, he may, if he would be elected, become way more to the left than, um, than the Republicans would expect. But shifting back to Coster again, okay, I was there for the veto session. The, de the Republicans were hammering at the Democrats, especially in the photo ID debate over the implementation bill, which the governor vetoed and it was overridden in the House and Senate, but the the Republicans, especially in the House, were hammering, saying, well, Coster has said he's fine with this bill. He finds it as a fine compromise, and I confirmed that with his campaign that that was his stance. Well, and then you know, on the gun bill, yeah. uh, Ron Richard, who's the head of the Senate, said in his closing remarks after the override vote in the Senate, and everything's at the end, he's like, well— Coster said that he would have signed it. Yeah. So my point being that where he may have carved this middle ground, but there was a lot of Democrats who were had their limb. They were on a limb. They and were got, undercut, basically. And they were undercut, and let, let's say he wins, okay? Correct. Okay, let's say he becomes governor. He's going to have all these Democratic legislators, some of whom may s still be a little ticked off over that because they don't, especially urban <clears throat> Democrats, they may be little concerned about his views on let's say now he has said he's against the constitutional amendment for photo id so if that manages to fail then that that argument people will just forget about that but the gun thing in particular where which has really become you know very touchy for democrats i could see where there could be some ill will there that i mean that I, no, could, I i agree with that and 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 i think clearly um, General Coster has a, a a a position on guns that is not down the line of the Democratic Party. It's not down mine. And I um, I come I come from a family. Everyone has guns. We all have guns. Everybody takes it for granted that people have guns. You know, I my the women in my family have been in law enforcement. I think it's kind of fun. That my sister and my sister in law, the women, and but so we have guns. Um, but we also believe that there can be reasonable restrictions on who gets a gun mm -hmm. and that it, you shouldn't and, have to worry about a And training. And training. training. Exactly. That ended up being a big issue. I, on the, on I the think so. Floor. And I, I, I think if you can't pass a background check, then you probably shouldn't have a gun. And who can't pass one? Well, somebody who probably shouldn't have a well, gun. Yeah, you know? I'm glad you mentioned background checks because you were alluding to that ad that Jason Kander did. And, you know, I've talked all often on the show about, you know, sometimes Democrats hide from typically Democratic positions. you got to give Jason Kander credit for basically saying, I'm for background checks. I'm for this solidly Democratic position that may not be super popular in a very creative way. Yeah, but, I mean, he's just so our listeners know, he's blindfolded while he puts together an assault weapon. Yeah, but from a messaging standpoint, I know that Chris Coster and Jason Kander are two separate people running two separate campaigns, but they are kind of linked somewhat politically in their fates. And, but but their positions are different. But their positions are different, mm -hmm. and he's basically making the argument, and I know a lot of his supporters are, and I'm talking about he, I mean Jason Kander, that Roy Blunt is too close to the NRA, and that's a bad thing. Whereas Coster is with the NRA, 
And I, I don't know how you can criticize Roy Blunt for being, you know, too close to the NRA and then be happy when Chris Coster gets the NRA endorsement. And I'm, by we, I'm not well, saying you. I'm not you. happy. I know well, you're not happy. <laughs> well, but I'm well. just talking about Democrats in Correct. general. Yeah, but, That's right. but, but Kander in this position, I think he's doing it. And I'm not defending him, but just saying tactically. Mm. Blunt got the NRA endorsement, and the NRA is running attack yes. ads on Kender, and, which is a difference. And that is which not, it was a difference. And, 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 right and, and, now, the NRA is not running attack ads against, against Greitens, mm. even though they endorse. Yeah, Coster. and, and that, that observation was by no means a criticism of of, of Jason Kander. By no. the way, it's more of just a sentiment right. that, uh, observation. But continue. No, but I, I think that's true. I I know that. I, I, well, I'm solidly a Democrat, which doesn't mean that I, I have the exact same position on all the Democratic issues that, that all the rest of the Democrats do either, because I, I come from a background that is a lot more conservative um, fiscally. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a 30-year CPA, and I look at things and, and monetary things in a, in, a, in a much more narrow view. And so there's a lot of budgetary things that I haven't agreed with the Democrats on. Um, but um, we as Democrats have always been a little more broad in, in accepting people who we, we say, I, I know that, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've known an awful lot of, of pro-life Democrats and we differ on this issue. But overall, we have the same general views if you package them all up and, and, we, and we try to get along. And we try not to talk about the one issue that we don't agree on. And I, I think that's what we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. I, there's a lot of people I know that are, are unhappy with Democrats, that are unhappy with, with Chris Coster because of his ag policy. Now, they have to be the people that are actually living in the rural areas so they understand ag policy, which the majority of the Democrats in the city don't. So, right. And what you're saying is absolutely true. If Chris Coster is the governor, knowing his position on ag policy, we're going to have a whole a, a even monumental different, shift. Even different from Nixon. Correct. Because Nixon, I think, was closer to the traditional Democratic on mm -hmm. ag policy, which was a little bit more skeptical of the big business. Yeah, but yeah, but on the other hand, Nixon, I would say, is more pro-ag than some of the urban Democrats. Yeah, that's that's, tr that's true. That's right. But not as much as Coster. I mean, mm -hmm. not, it's a it's a it's a continuing shift mm -hmm. when, if, if 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 he becomes governor. Right. But but you have some things that you know that like the the couple of bills that would affect our our civil justice system mm -hmm. they did not get overridden um mm -hmm. there's a more of a middle area there so the the collateral source and mm -hmm. the and the expert witness stuff those things are still you know the the same laws there so you get you get some things that um you get a hard push because the chamber of commerce pushes hard but but at the end of the day people will see two different sides on those types of issues. And so it, I guess it comes down to which is the one issue that is most important to you and if you can agree with somebody on it or not. And for most of our Democrats, the one issue, if it is ag, ag policy, then they're going to have a problem with with a choice between these two guys, um, the, the traditional Democrat who would have their back and now doesn't um, versus somebody who's a Republican who is probably never going to have their back either. <laughs> So my final question for you, it's the same question I asked Sarah Steelman, will you ever run for anything again? You know, I, I don't know. I, I really have enjoyed um, not running uh, this year. It's been great. Although, like I said, I've done some call time, so I, I'm still out there doing some things. So I, I never say never, but it's not, uh, it's not in my plan. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you ever have uh, dreams of being lieutenant governor again, <laughs> if Mike yeah, Carson wins. <laughs> I'm not going to dream of being lieutenant governor again. Well, that, that one came and went. <laughs> well, with all due respect to previous lieutenant governors, you do sometimes have a lot of time on your hands, depending <laughs> on the situation. We want to thank you for coming to St. Louis. This has been great. We Thanks. always appreciate talking with you. For all of our stories, stlpublicradio.org. Follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. Follow Joe on Twitter at Jay Manis. That's J-M-A-N-N-I-E-S. And how would we follow you on social media, if at all? <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm I'm there. I'm there. It's Susan Monty. And uh, I, I still have my website, and I still do a few things out there. So you can still find me. Check her out on social media. <laughs> we'll be back next time. Until then, so long. But I was there. If you 
have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio.